What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 720. My name is Marshall, one of your limited resources, and joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. You know, Cube's back online. I'm enjoying it. What, what else is there to, there's nothing to complain about. Yeah, are you, um, are you doing like league cues uh, uh, on your videos, uh, or are you still doing mostly the team draft? It's a combination. Um, I enjoy doing both. Like doing uh, draft leagues is a little bit more time efficient, which is kind of nice. Uh, but and you also get some really nice decks, so it can be fun <laughs> to do that. Te- teams can also be really fun because it's like a really good challenge level, and uh, I like all the people I'm playing with. Like uh, so, it's 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 fun to hang out with them. There's also a third option, which is the 64 player drafts, and those are also very cool. I think that uh, those. They're a bit more of a time commitment than either, but they can be a ton of fun. Yeah, those are where you have to basically win a draft <clears throat> to qualify for the next draft, and then you have to win that draft to win the whole thing. Uh, they're difficult, but they're they're definitely really cool. All right, well, that's awesome. Uh, this episode of the show is the one where we have Sirkovitz on. Sirko, welcome back. Coming to you from Cornwall in the Correct. UK. Correct. No see hesitation. That, uh... It took some. It took some uh, repetition. But no, th- no, that just flowed out, just right out. I mean, super easy. Didn't even think of Wales for a heartbeat. Good, that's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, always as always, a uh, pleasure to be here. It's uh, it's been a while, so uh, it's nice to catch up with you guys. Yeah, thanks for coming back on. We're super happy to have you on as always. And today we're going to get your take on Wilds of Eldraine. Before we uh, jump in to uh, those topics and others let's mention our patreon it's patreon.com slash limited resources just want to say thank you to everybody who supports us on the patreon it means a lot to us and uh, if you do sign up you get a thank you card and a sticker in the mail and uh, you get access to the patreon feed which gives you like we did our q a episode last week you get access to that you also get uh you know for our uh question of the week thread and that kind of stuff i actually took the uh, the question for the question of the week from the Q and A episode because I thought it would uh, line up with for Sirkovitz actually this one comes from David who says um, how so David's asking Luis and I how big do you think your influence is on the limited metagame have you ever noticed a draft strategy that was very open suddenly being less easy to get as soon as you talked about it on the podcast do you think that um, it might have value to shy away from strategies that we've talked about on the show for a little while after it drops. So Luis, we'll start with you. Um, Do you think that there's an impact, like a feelable impact based on that? Yeah. I mean, every single person who joins the arena queues has our podcast going while they do. So (laughs) I I think that actually it does have an impact in some cases, and it kind of depends on what the strategies we're talking about. Like I actually remember, uh, you know, and this is like obviously somewhat anecdotal, this isn't listeners self-reporting, but when Ben S talked about how blue was actually good in uh, Phyrexia All Will Be One, like some people said that they they weren't getting seventh pick uh, Raptors anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think when it's like, if we say like, you know, in Wilds of Eldraine, wow, you know, Imidane's recruiter is great. Red, black, and green are all great. That's not really going to change much because those things are pretty on their surface, self-evident. Most people get to it. Um, even the people who use 17 lands eventually understood it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> when it comes to a maybe more offbeat strategy or one that's not as inherently obvious, I do think that we can't have an impact. There's a lot of people who listen to the show and a lot of people who listen to the show are good. So these people are, are like if you're if you're out there trying to listen to a magic podcast really of any sort, you're interested in improving. Like you, you're spending the time to do that. So I think that, yes, at especially at some like – partitions of the draft metagame, you'll see more of an impact uh, than not. I mean, I know that when it comes to cube, for example, I think stuff that we really talk about or we push or I talk, do in my videos a lot, like, you know, Tolarian Academy strategies. Like I literally, I lost to someone who was like, yeah, I drafted an Academy deck. Like I saw you draft in your cube drafts. You know, totally. (laughs) It happens. I I mean, I can definitely, I mean, again, it's anecdotal, but I can definitely feel it. You know, those changes happening. Um, Sirkovitz, what do you think? Do you have a sense for if things like us on the podcast or, um, I don't know, you know, one of your presentations or if a pro makes a big Twitter, uh, Twitter thread or something like that, where there's something that could 
potentially change the metagame if it actually does? And if so, how would we know or how would, would, would that be measurable? So I'm actually, I was very uh, quickly Googling stuff while, uh, while Lewis was talking. I checked what day was the uh, episode with Ben Stark recorded, and I now uh, went on the 17 lands, and I'm looking at the draft trends for blue cards. And there is actually, on the 10th of, uh, on the 10th of uh, March, the day that the uh, LR was released, Gitaxian Raptor was, had also around like 6.7. Mm -hmm. And over the next four or five days, it went basically up to, um, or down to uh, 5.2, 5.3 maybe. So there was like a me 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 measurable change in how Gitaxian Raptor was, uh, was drafted uh, in the days that were following the, um, the episode and a couple of other blue cards uh, uh, changed in their uh, appreciation. Of course, it's hard to say that it was the impact of Ben Stark. Uh, there has been some change in blue cards a couple of days before already, so there might have been a move for some blue cards, but nonetheless, you can actually measure that. And that's just one example, of course, but I, I do think that generally there are several stages of how the formats develop. And I think that especially the first two weeks after the set has been released, there is a big impact of content creation on what is going on. And of course, it's very hard to disentangle the LR impact from the impact of any other content creator. Obviously, you have a large audience, uh, so that's going to be uh, important. But there will be people that specialize in a particular deck and then reveal some kind of a play guide and people start drafting it more frequently. You will see those things um, happening. The problem, of course, is that out of you know thousands of people that draft Arena, only a fraction of them will uh, consume content creation. So uh, very frequently, their, the impact of any content creator is going to be limited by the fact how many people can you reach. And um, I don't know the exact number, so it's very hard to say. I know that in terms of how data is being generated, there's going to be a very big impact because most people who use 17 Lens are also going to be consumers of content. So you will see much more data shifts within what 17 lens collects from only 17 lens users. And there will be a smaller shift uh, when we look at ALSA, which is independent of uh, whether you are a user of 17 lens or not, your data is going to be collected because that's how packs are going to be distributed. Ah, in I see. <clears throat> so that would be the place to look to see the if, if there's an impact on the overall player pool, because I was going to say what you said, which is, yeah, the, the uh, 17 lands users and our listenership has to have a pretty strong crossover. I mean, we have you on, you know, once per set, we talk about 17 lands a lot. Like we love 17 lands. So, you know, there's probably a pretty big correlation. I, I mean, w would we have circle on if we didn't think that it was like kind of like throwing a bone to all the 17 lands listeners? I, there's no way to really disentangle those two factors. So. <laughs> I was just you, trying to you take don't a have to take this, Sirkovitz. You know, like the last <laughs> couple of times he came on, Luis, you couldn't be on. And he was like, well, I didn't get to, you know, go back and forth with Luis. Well, here you go, Sirko. You <laughs> asked for it. <laughs> He's bashing 17 lands twice before he even had a sentence out. That's uh, fine. I only know I, I know that he only does it because he loves us so much. Well, I, I will say the second one was me making fun of Sirkovitz, not 17 lands. Fair. But, uh, That's true. Yeah. yeah. But I, 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 as I've said before, I only make fun of people I like. So. It's true. He's actually not, yeah. Like, I mean, he'll make fun of people he doesn't like, but you have to get behind the scenes on the Patreon <laughs> for that. You know, that's the, <laughs> the mic'd up version of Luis. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, great question. Um, we have another, we have a follow up question <laughs> that we used um, for one of our question of the weeks not that long ago. And it was about fun. And I, we wanted to run this by Sirkovitz. Um, we had a question from Nathan who says, um, I have a simple question, maybe a bad one, but I've struggled to answer it at times. How do you know when you're having fun? Like, especially in the context of magic. And most of the time, it's uh, because of the rolling of the eyes of people around me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> if other people are shaking their heads or rolling their eyes, then you're having a good time. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> that is fantastic. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's do a crack a pack. Um, and we'll kind of let you be, get the final word on the, on the crack a pack as well. Um, Circo, cause I like using these ones. Cause you know, we usually have you come in, uh, after the format's a little bit more matured and you've had a chance uh, to, to capture your data and all that kind of stuff. And, 
and of course draft a bunch. And so I'm curious where you're at in in Wilds of Eldraine. Also, I, you know, I do want to say, um, I've just been playing Vintage Cube since it came out, and I haven't missed Wilds of Eldraine. I don't really care about going back to it. I kind of find it boring, to be honest. Like one of the most kind of flat sets in a long time. Not necessarily saying it's flawed. It's just has not hit me in a way that makes me like excited to draft it. Um, which I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there because I've, I've been thinking about that uh, recently. Luis, where are you? I know you've been, you know, doing a bunch of cubes. Are you still drafting wilds at all? Like, is it on your radar? Um, I have drafted it some, I think I've drafted it a couple times since I got back from Vegas, but for me, the other big thing is I, like, I wasn't playing at worlds, unfortunately, but, uh, Vegas was the, had the hundred K, which was kind of similar, which was, I have an event that I'm preparing for. I drafted a bunch. And then once the event is over, it kind of loses some luster for me. Like the mm -hmm. set has to be really, really fun for me to want to draft it. Be not because I've only drafted it for the event. That's actually not the right conclusion here. It's because when I'm drafting it in preparation for event, it's like that extra bit of seasoning on top. It's right. It's the hot sauce on top of the, the burrito bowl. If it were, if you will, once the event's over and I know I'm not preparing for anything. Well, if I'm not preparing for anything, like I just like cube more than everything else. Yeah. If I have thing I'm preparing for, then I like it though. You could be argued. Maybe you should have prepared more for the showdown given how badly we got trounced. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. you know, We'll, we'll we'll get him next time. Um, I think that uh, I think that Wilds is like firmly in the middle of the pack for me. Like it's fine, but it's not great. Whereas like the the, the recent sets that I played after the their given Pro Tour were March of the Machines and Brothers War. Those are the two sets where like the Pro Tour came and went, and I was still just drafting because I really enjoyed the sets. Totally, that's my norm. I mean, normally I'll just go back to it. Circo, do you like this set? Yeah, I think the the set has some really strong and good point. And in my case, that's mostly exclusively Golgari, but uh, that's a different story. I think that there's a lot of missed opportunities. I think it could have been a much better set. And I think that uh, generally it's the first time I feel like the additional slot was pretty much a failure for some reason. And there's just too many unplayable cards in it. The cards and, suck. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it hurts you when you open, then there's like intruder alert or something. Right. Yeah, I, I do. I feel that way too. Uh, this is definitely going to be in the lessons learned for the sunset um, thing, which is that I have been really liking the bonus sheet and I've been pushing for, like I said on the last few sets, I'd like to see this for every set. Like, I just think this is a cool wrinkle. It's a cool addition. It just brings a lot of different things to the table as far as card quality uh, selection, weird stuff, off the wall stuff. And then I'm sure it serves some purpose of getting, you know, reprints onto arena or whatever, you know, uh, constructed specific goals they have or something. And I'm just like, win, 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 win. And this is the first one where I agree with what you said, Sirko. It, 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 there's just too many cards that are just blanks. They're just, they're non cards that doesn't drag down the set, but it feels like a missed opportunity. Like you said, um, okay, well, let's get into this crack pack here. Uh, first card out <clears throat> is actually a foil. It's Conceited Witch, the 2-3 the Menace. Yeah, it's fine, but nothing to write home about. Uh, Kindled Heroism, the, nope. the red plus one plus oh and first strike scry one. I would hope not. Yeah. Um, Leaping Ambush. I mean, the card is actually good in some places, but not for the first pick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Verdant Outrider, the 4-2 for Tuna G. Good in some sp places, but not for the first pick. What, what, where do you like it? Uh, I like it uh, in red-green kind of aggressive deck. Okay. Uh, cool. Very aggressive deck with a bunch of combat tricks. I think it, they are actually in the same home with Leaping Ambush. Okay. Possibly yeah. with Season of Growth, even, if you want to go super spicy. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because Verdant Outrider demands to be blocked and does get blocked. So it allows you to you know, not force, but to highly encourage your opponent to trade your combat trick for their two drop or whatever, which, yeah. you know, if that's what you're in the business of doing, then it does. Make it also do sometimes, that. it also sometimes uh, does not allow it to be blocked, which is also a good option on it later in the game. Yeah, for sure. Um, hopeful vigil. Can I interest you in a hopeful vigil? Yes, you definitely can interest me in a hopeful vigil. Uh, for now, that's definitely the pick. Uh, beanstalk worm. 
I think overvalued as a card by many people. Uh, it's medium. Medium, you said? Okay, yeah. Uh, Diminisher Witch? That's an interesting card, but definitely not for the first pick. How about Cut In? Now, that's a card, uh, and I would actually have a difficulty between choosing between Cut In and Hopeful Vigil. I think Cut In is strictly a better card, uh, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but recently, I felt like every time I tried to go into red, I'm being pushed out of it, and... Uh, Cutting also is not going to be excellent in every single uh, red deck. Okay. Luis, what do you think about between cut in and hopeful vigil? I, I'm leaning towards taking cut in just because I think a t as a tiebreaker, I would rather start with a red card than a white card. Okay. I'm just not, I'm not, uh, I'm not as into white. I just feel like white has fewer off ramps. For, like red white is obviously great. In fact, you know, at times has had the best win percentage overall, but Fast red white, like I do like blue white, and that one's fine. But uh, I'm not super high on black white or green white. So, whereas red, I like really red with any of the colors. So, I, I, I would rather start with a red card. Our last common is Minstrosity. Oh, I love that guy. Um, yeah, does that bump out either of these though? No, no, it doesn't. I, I think that like, I like my Minstrosities somewhere between picks five and seven or something mm -hmm. like that. Okay, so. If if this was a whole pack, where would you land, Circo? Would you would you land on cut in, or is that fear of getting pushed out strong enough I that you stay with vigil? The only way of not getting pushed out is to assert your dominance. So I guess I'm cut in is a better pick. I would probably pick cut in. Hopeful vigil. I love the card. It's a great card, but you also want to make sure when you start picking hopeful vigils that white is absolutely open on the table, and that's the problem because it doesn't have a long roster of commons. So I would. Probably not first pick it. I am going to be very happy to pick it like, you know, pick five or something in first pack, because then I know that at least four people said no to Hopeful Vigil, which gives me some kind of uh, hope Yeah. Uh, that the white is going to be flowing. Because if it doesn't flow, then you have to put so many fringe playables and, and unplayables into the deck in order to make it uh, that probably is not worth it. So I would say white, a color that you want to make sure that is open. Same with blue. Yeah, these are these are often the trickiest picks, right? Because if you didn't mind being in white, hopeful vigil, funny enough, white not super deep, but that's the best common. Like mm. that's the place to start if you're gonna if you're gonna be in white. But as you mentioned, if you're sharing it with somebody near you, uh it can get pretty ugly pretty quick. Uh uncommons. First one is Totentance Swarm Piper. So I never played it actually. I never managed to draft a rat deck for some what? reason. No, I don't know. It's not even just a rat card. That's true, but you probably want it in the more rat flavored version of uh, mm, red rat black. flavored. Uh, I, <laughs> I would, uh, yep. I would struggle to see a black red deck that wouldn't put the card in the deck, though. I agree, it's better if you're working towards it. I played a lot against it, and uh, it, there's been games when it been absolutely backbreaking, and there's been games when it was pretty much irrelevant, but it had to eat a removal, which is always a good sign for a card. I, I still think that I would pick Cotton over it uh, because Cotton just doesn't put me in two colors just in one. Um, what about Gallant Pie Wielder? That's the one that can get double strike with Celebration. Uh, I like Hopeful Vigil more. That's the first thing. So um, oh, okay. that already loses on that front. And then obviously it has the same problem as any white card I would have been picking. Um, Ariette's Tempting Apple. This is the, the colorless threaten. I love that card. I put it frequently in my aggressive decks because it's a great um, Lava Axe kind of card. Uh -huh. uh, and last time I played it, I stole a 10-9 ten, ten Trampler and uh, then went uh, three-face and I finished the game. I had absolutely no business of winning. It's, uh, wow. it's pretty good. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah, that's a way to stack up 13 damage real quick. So you said you love it, you play it, where does it rank against Cut In, Hopeful Vigil, Totem Tance, that type of thing? It plays the same kind of role as a Cut In does, which means clearing the blocks and, and, and making sure that you get uh, a lot of damage face. But it's a much Cut In is a much better card early. I would pick Cut It over it still. I want my Ariets Tempting Apples somewhat later in the draft. And, and I usually get them slightly later in the draft. So Yeah, of course, you know, Ariets Tempting Apple does the same thing when you're being aggressive. But when you're on the back foot or if you have a more mid-range or controlling deck, then cut in allows you to 
Gives you three life. Kill threats. Yeah, there you go. Steal your guy. Don't do anything with it. Sack this game three. <laughs> just the just the cool six mana game three. Um, we have two rares. One of them is from the bonus sheet. It is Oppression, which is the one black black. Whenever a player casts a spell, they discard a card. Not too oppressive, is it? This is a no. this is why this particular bonus sheet flopped a bit, right? Just cards like this where you just don't even I, I can't even imagine, you know, like they've had a few bonus sheet cards that were very narrow, but you're like, you know, by draft 55, I'm going to go for that. You know, <laughs> it's stupid and I, and I, whatever, but I'm just going to take a shot and see if I can't build around that thing. And oppression, just like, there's no imagination. Like, you know yeah, what, what I mean? What, I don't, what I don't, is your dream here? Right. Like what, what am I trying to accomplish? And I, I can't figure it out. Um, I, I, mm -hmm. I think that oppression is one good card in, in a way. If you think that oppression is a good card and you listen to limited resources, then probably you should re-listen to uh, the episodes that, about card evaluation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope none of our listeners are like, "Oh, oppression, we did it." Um, our rare is Raging Battle Mouse. That's the one in a red two one, and uh, your second spell each turn costs one less to cast, and it has celebration. Um, what does it get? A counter or something? I can't remember actually. Plus one, uh, plus one on plus the end one, of plus turn. Target creature you control gets plus one. Plus, yeah. If it so, gave a counter, whoa. <laughs> yeah. So that's a lot for a two drop. Yeah, it's like a two mana mana dork. Unfortunately, with one toughness, which sort of bumps it slightly down for my evaluation because of the flick the coin and rat outs uh, that are running around tables. Yep. I think it's a good card. I played it once in my deck, but I never drew it. So I don't have very extensive experience playing it and i don't know I, I i might actually pick it but i don't know if cotton is not just a better card i think cut, cut in's a better card but really? I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm i have a good chance of getting a cotton again but i have a very small chance of getting another raging battle mouse yeah i i think the is issue that, is, is that a good way to think about things i guess I, I don't know it can it can be when it comes to like expensive cards and cutting costs four i suppose I just, I, how often, if you turn to a battle mouse, do you actually get to take advantage of the spell reduction? Right? I, I assume it's like I mean, probably I would hope that if you 0.8 pick times it, you're going per game. In. Yeah. Cut in's like 2.2% 2, 2 higher game in hand win rate. So it, that, that's a pretty significant amount. I like cut in better. I, I don't know. The battle, if the battle mouse. I don't know if it made the first spell or I don't, if, if it was like a more guaranteed way to generate a little bit of mana, that would be really nice. Like his aggressive deck that can play something that can hit for two on two pump up guys sometimes. And then also dump your hand is really pretty impressive, but second spell each turn is difficult, right? It's you, you need I, kind of a very particular lineup to make that work. I assume that uh, without checking that uh, Raging Battle Mouse has an excellent opening hand win rate and then a pretty bad games drawn win rate mm. because obviously it's Should a pretty a bit, bad top yeah. deck late in the game. Yeah, definitely. I would assume that too. I would take cut in. What would you take, Luis? I'd probably take cut in. Honestly, what I would I would have done actually what I just did, which is I would look at the two cards and I'd be like, hmm, I wonder which one actually like what said what does seventeen lens say about this? Because mm -hmm. I would I would want to take the battle mouse and then I would see that and be like, yeah, maybe I'll just take the cut in. Yeah, That's, I, I would do something that I do quite frequently actually. <laughs> well, I think that is one of the useful spots, right? Because you know we've talked and we will talk on this episode about you know how to manage the data and stuff. That's been one of the things that we've kind of been trumpeting since seventeen lands came out was we recognized immediately what a great tool it is, but we also recognized how difficult it can be to accurately try to get data from these type of tools and also how misleading it can be if you don't properly do it. And, but I have found that like on a tiebreaker scenario, you know, if it's 2% difference, like that's a lot to make up for situational stuff or whatever. Like to me, that's, you know, if I'm like, oh, these are really close and I look it up and one of them's 2% win rate better, like I'm taking the, that one, you know, that, that is, that is a significant enough bounce that it's not just like, you know, splitting hairs or whatever. That's a, that's a big, bigger jump. Um, are you going to take the raging battle mouse? Because yeah, because I like to t try, try how it plays out. I, yeah, I, I frequently draft in a way that I'm picking cards that I never played. Luis, is it weird that they made a mouse 
in a in a set that's like rat supported. Like just yeah. design wise, it's kind of like I don't. They're zigging uh, like, and zagging yeah, a little. Yeah, I mean, it's like a little weird, but it, it's it's fine. Okay, it's the plant for the next set with the <laughs> red wool for <laughs> constructed. There's okay. going to be a mouse tribal. I, I, you, I, you can bet on it. I'm, I'm not kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding. There's going to be a mouse what? tribal in the in the set. I, I can, I can bet like a five oh, or yeah. something. I mean, I don't know if you're you're familiar with the source material. I know it's not literally red wall, but it like it, it is obviously taking after that. And yeah, that, oh, I, I didn't be, know that. That's I would what be pretty surprised if there wasn't a if there wasn't any sort of mouse, if not tribal themed at some in some way. So we got three blind mice. The battle mouse, and then whatever the we get. The two one. There's the two one mouse. Oh, the cheeky house mouse. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, Boris mouse Weiss. tribal. It's actually coming together. All right. Uh, weird in a set full of rats, but fair enough. Um, okay, let's talk um, something that we had touched on a little bit earlier with regards to like how things can change format wise. And I mentioned that I had a very brief chat with Carl Serap and. I also, I think I mentioned it, but if I didn't, um, I did uh, have a DM conversation with him as well, and uh, we'd like to have him come on the show at some point. He's, you know, he's a huge limited guy, so it would be cool to pick his brain, so we're going to work on that. But one of the things that came out of that conversation was the blue-white, and I was curious, Circo, if if you have a sense for... um, if the metagame has shifted towards it, or if there's if anything happened after that, cause Carl talked about it on the, I think on the, on the world stream a little bit too. And we talked about it on the podcast. So it kind of got out there, you know, that at least there was a, a way to draft blue white. That wasn't the way that was presented to us by wizards with this whole caring about tapping down your opponent's creature nonsense. Instead, you know, it was a much more straightforward kind of controlling mid range deck you know, they just played the best spells from each color and it actually put together a reasonably cohesive plan that you could win draft matches with, even though, you know, up until that point, it had been truly the worst color pair. And one of the worst we've seen in a while, you know, on 17 lands, it was at like 50.1% when we did that show. And that's, you know, not corrected for the 17 lands user base. That is disastrous. I mean, that's a really horrible archetype. Have you... Do you have any sense for if those things have changed, if people were able to pick up on a on a better way to build blue white and, and actually have done so? So I think that generally um blue white is a trap if you want to draft it as the signpost and commons posts you to. So all those uh, top decks, especially when you play the, there's a lot of pretty bad top cards in this format. And mm-hmm. and if you try to build it around that theme, you're going to be very much losing. And I think that this is the main driver of the win rate of those cards in um, in uh, 17 lands. That on lots the, of people on try the individual to cards. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on the on the individual cards, but of course, because people try to draft the deck in a way that doesn't work. Obviously, it's going to also reflect the win rate of the uh, color combination. I do think that white-blue decks can be very strong. And we've seen, like, definitely Carl and his team were testing blue-white in their preparation for the Worlds, um, as you chatted with him. Also, you could see that there was a bunch of trophy decks with blue-white during the Worlds, um, which is not an accident. You know, to go 3-0 in a pod with uh, people who qualified for the World Championship, that's something. So clearly there is ways of drafting this deck. And actually a couple of days before the Worlds, I made a a thread where I was writing about my advice to people, right? Very unsolicited advice uh, to people uh, who will be at the Worlds uh, that I could take from the 17 lands. And one of the points was uh, do draft white and blue and blue and black. Uh, Both of those decks seem like quite- You said to people who are playing in Worlds? Well, that was just basically to anyone. I just Unnamed. used the excuse. Okay, okay. A, a, excuse, excuse. To, I wonder, yeah, uh, okay. To, so so you're actually the, you discovered blue-white. No, I didn't. I mean, uh, I cannot <laughs> discover anything because I am analyzing the data and that data had to be generated by people who play and they actually discover. I just report my uh, their discoveries by analyzing large chunks of data. So 
it's a common misconception that I discover anything. I don't discover anything because there has to be game data for me to uh, write about anything. And if there is a game data and it points to something, someone else discovered it way before me. I just am the one no, that found it. No, come and on. That's ridiculous. You can discover things. Of course you can. Each of us are just acting independently, trying to win a draft. We're not like exploring. You have the ability to see the the game map from the big picture and you can, you know, figure things out uh, on that level. Okay, fine. You didn't literally draft the decks, but come on, man. Give yourself some credit here. I, I'm not going to give myself a lot of credit because I already <laughs> heard like a bunch of content creation talking about how to play white blue. Um, I think Sam Black was also talking about it. So there, 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 there are things. So, uh, um, but generally, both white blue and blue black look like they are great control decks. They have a bunch of removal. They have a bunch of um, card draw, um, and you can play this kind of attrition game when you uh, kill everything that is worth killing. Uh, you play the maybe bigger creatures late, or you just completely overrun your opponent with a card advantage. You have things like hatching plants, you have the into the fairy court, uh, you have the quick um, quick study. All those things will you know put you ahead on cards. Uh, if you're playing blue-white, you have the good old combo of um, stockpiling celebrant and uh, hopeful vigil, or if you're lucky enough, Princess takes flight and you can just basically chain those kind of uh, interactions. You have cards that aggressive white decks will not want to play in Kellen Lightblades, for example. This also is a good bargain source. So you can play Kellen Lightblades and Hatching Plants, Kellen Lightblades and Princess takes flight. Yeah. Uh, all those kind of things work together. And you you know, you still can lean a bit on the synergies from the set. You can I think that Charay is a pretty good card on its own. You don't need to like have 17 no. different ways of tapping things. You just can just play Charay, yeah. draw a card, happy times. Yeah. And I think that this deck is quite strong. Under certain caveats, you really need to have a bunch of card draw. I think like a hatching plants and um, one into the fake card is at minimum what you need. So at mm -hmm. least two of those draw three card spells. Um, you need to definitely make sure that you have uh, a bunch of interaction. And I would not feel comfortable playing this deck without like at least one or two copies of counter spells, preferably um, Ice Out. Okay. Ice okay. Out is a, so Ice Out is, I think, the most pivotal card for that. And that was what I was writing in my thread. That was actually, um, it was more about how to analyze data if you're playing in, in high level pods. Because, of course, Arena's charm and drawback, depending on how you're looking at it, is that. Average pod will contain a whole range of drafters, from really invested ones to maybe someone that is drafting for the first time in their life. Now, World Championship, hopefully, hopefully you will not find someone that drafts for the first time in their life. Although I heard that someone played their first draft in their life on the day two of the Pro Tour after missing the first day draft because of being late. Anyway, that's a very weird story. What the? Okay. Um, but because you will have those good players, you will not have situations like in uh, arena drafts where sometimes a really strong card wheels mm -hmm. because people will just pounce on that card earlier and treat it as a signal and they will try to find their lane. Lots of people will be drafting the hard way. Uh, so you cannot count on having, you know, 29, 35 playables in your deck that you have to trim because there's too much of goodness. Most of the time your decks will be more scrappy. Uh, and also... If you're playing with good players, you better also look at the good player data when you're analyzing what you want to be doing. And for example, I'm going to give you the numbers uh, from the memory, but if I remembered correctly, Ice Out was maybe like 40th, maybe 50th most winning common in, um, in the general 17 lands data set. Okay. If you only looked at the top players, it was number eight. It was in top 10 of the best commons uh, in the set. Mm. Uh, so a massive difference, and there are good reasons for that. Like, first of all, it plays really well with this plan of blue-white control. When you want to sacrifice your princess takes flight, you don't mind sacrificing your uh, hopeful vigil and uh, potentially scrying two to fix your draws. Uh, you don't mind, you, you obviously have the hatching plan. So um, uh, all those things play together with it very well. Also, because you're playing a control game, you're going to play longer games, hopefully, because the longer the game takes, the more chance of you winning. But, of course, the problem of playing long games is that opponent will see most of their decks, so their most atrocious bombs will also be very likely seen. 
So if you're playing against someone who has graph triplets, good chance they're going to draw it, and this card removal is not super efficient against it. Uh, so countering it on stack is one of the ways how you're not losing a game like this. So it's super important to have a couple of counter spells. And I thought that how many times did I cast I out in this format when I could have paid three mana, but I just preferred to sacrifice something and bargain was actually a, a, a pure upside there. Yeah, right. Interesting. Um, would you assume that the good players play blue-white more? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if they play more. I think that they will be very willing to play it when they see the lane open. But it also is not the kind of a deck that you can force, really, because mm. you have to have specific cards being open. I think that most of the time when I was ending on that kind of a deck, it was when I started drafting some kind of a white aggro and I had a couple of hopeful vigils, but then the aggro lane dried out and I saw that blue was open and I started drafting blue. Or if I started with some kind of a blue bomb, preferably, you know, the horned lock whale, mm. or uh, there is the blue and an X uh, double drawing dude with skulk. Yeah, those kinds of cards are are the ones that uh, you probably want to be looking at. And there's like a couple of cards that are interesting, but maybe um, not obvious. I think that uh, the Ice Rod Sentry is a pretty good card in this mm. deck, the okay. two three Vigilance, because it is a creature that can put some pressure actually yeah. for not too much mana. If you have like a Sharae or, or 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 even two, that can generate extra value and draw extra cards if you want to, and will. Sometimes we'll force your opponent to just attack into it, not to give you card advantage for some weird reasons. Um, and also it's like a decent blocker. It can attack without uh, you committing a creature because it has Vigilance. So uh, that card is usually quite useful in those decks. Uh, I would recommend playing it. Uh, obviously, like Threadbind Click is good. Archive Dragon can be a good top end for your decks. Uh, one card that is notoriously, I think, uh, underappreciated is Picklock Prankster. Mm -hmm. This one is also good because if you start because you open like a blue bomb. If you start on blue, Picklock Prankster is even better when you play blue-black control. So it helps you to be this kind of a pivotal card. When you pick I, it early, you have that flexibility. I've seen a lot of Picklock Pranksters uh, deck their controllers, I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've had that experience both playing with and against the card that like, you get a little ambitious with it and you end up uh, running out of cards. But it's not, it doesn't mean the card's bad. It is just a card. You have to have a enough win conditions to be able to just get milled for four or eight and still close out the game. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. But I also had those annoying games when just like, oh, they have a Pickwick Prancer, they put a Wicked Roll on it, and oh my god, this clock becomes a real thing right now. And it also stops me from attacking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, you mentioned that there's some cards that, uh, that have caught your eye or that you wanted to talk about, and one of them you mentioned was Up the Beanstalk. Oh, yes, the up the beanstalk. Uh, what a classic card. Uh, obviously, we're going to talk about the uh, four color in modern, I assume. That's, that's what you wanted to chat about. No, that is not what I wanted to. Although we did see that card see extensive play even in standard at World Championship. But it also was first picked um, by Nathan. He, he took it yes. very aggressively, shall we say. I would say too aggressively. So, um, of course, uh, he's Nathan Stoyer. I'm just a random middle-aged bloke. So uh, let's not forget about that. Uh, and also, I don't know the exact specifics of the pot drafting in this format because I only analyze arena drafting. So I can only give advice on arena, to be fair. Um, I still thought that this was a very aggressive first pick. Uh, and also, uh, we've seen why picking it too aggressively can turn out not so great because we saw it literally in this World Championship draft. So um, I was watching this draft and I was seeing like pack and pack after pack without any five drops. And then this first pick up the Beanstalk, which I think changed the mindset of how Nathan was drafting uh, slightly, turned from worse to worse as the draft progressed. And sometimes this will happen uh, when you first pick a card like that. Um, and I don't know how highly it is being picked in the pod drafts, but I do know how highly it's being picked on Arena. And because I know that, and for example, it will wheel around 25% of the time in pack one, and it wow. will wheel around 40% of the time in pack three. 
because uh, I looked very specifically into those numbers. So uh, this is not a card you have to prioritize. And also, this is not a card that is always amazing. If it was always amazing, I would understand first picking it. But it sometimes can be a detriment to the deck. Um, and also, it's not like great in every single color combination. And also, not single co every single color combination you play it is great in its own. Mm -hmm. So um, there are many caveats on, on, on playing this card. Uh, best home for it is Golgari. Yep. Um, that's where uh, up the Beanstalk has the highest win rate, at around 58% win rate of the Beanstalk decks uh, in Golgari. And it's also pretty good in like uh, red, green, in, and in three color combinations. Uh, it's, uh, it's good in... Uh, mm. Gruel? No, it, it, it's it's a, it's okay in Gruel. Oh yeah, it, it's actually not okay in Timur. Uh, blue, black, green, come on, help me up. Sultai. Sultai, Abzan, and John. Uh, these are the colors. <laughs> yeah, Zagoth. <laughs> Luis, is, yeah, Luis is up to date. <laughs> uh, but then again, you also have to keep in mind uh, that, for example, it's good in Gruel. It, the decks with up the Beanstalk and Gruel have like 56% win rate. But also, um, if you draw it, they have exactly the same win rate. So um, if you calculate what happens when you draw it, it's actively good in uh, Golgari, it's actively good in Simic, it's actively good in uh, Selesnya, uh, uh, Sultai, uh, Timur, and Abzan. But it's not actively good in Junt. So when we combine all those things, it basically means that blue-green is a bad archetype, up the beanstalk is good in it. But still, you're drafting technically an, uh, a better archetype. Uh, in Golgari, it's both good and it still makes it better when you draw it. So that's the perfect home for it. And um, and Sultai and uh, Abzan are also quite decent with it. So uh, you probably should be aiming at drafting one of those combinations uh, when you're playing it. Do you, there's a description that we use for cards like Up the Beanstalk. Uh, it's really one of the best descriptors um, because... For example, Nathan Stoyer's draft, he took it over Torch the Tower and Witchstalker Frenzy to proven, reliable removal spells in a, in a desirable color, at least. Maybe desirable is not the good word, but in a deep, powerful color that might be overdrafted. Um, we tend to think of these cards as having a fairly high floor. You know, you, you pay too many, you get your card back, Right. And then the ceiling on them tends to be quite high, right? If you get to pop off with up the beanstalk and draw two or three extra cards in a game, you know, all of a sudden that that ended up being kind of the difference for you. Do, do you believe in that as it plays out in the numbers? Because we can describe it in that way and it can be useful to kind of understand. But, you know, if a card is doing 58% in like a favorable situation... That's decent. Oh, no, but this is not the 58% of the win rate of the card. This is the 58% of the decks that only have it. So we're talking that the decks that contain it already will have a 58% win rate, 60% when you draw it. So that's pretty good, uh, I would say, looking at the whole archetype. Yeah, um, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, is it useful to describe a card in that way? Like, like a decent floor and high ceiling? Yeah. Because that I makes it that, sound like you can't go wrong, right? It makes it sound like, well, you're going to pay a small cost to have it, but you might be able to like really go off. And that to me, what we're really saying is, is that you're breaking even if you just pay the two man and get your card back, but that you have this like very powerful upside if you get to five mana and can cast a couple of five drops, all of a sudden, you know, you, you can chain this together and kind of not lose the game. But that would, to me, would lead to a higher win rate. Right. Like mm -hmm. it makes me think that that floor is actually lower, like that spending two mana to draw a card. We know that's not good. That's not what we want to be doing, but it might be like really bad. Right. Like in order to kind of draw down that win percentage on something that feels almost like a free roll. Yeah, I think that the floor is acceptable more than good. Like two mana to draw a card and put a piece of cardboard on the uh, on the on the board, because let's not forget you're left for potentially something to bargain. Right. Uh, it's just not not good enough. Although if if it was good enough, you would be playing ground seal or something like that yeah. routinely, mm -hmm. and you don't. 
And right. there is a good reason why you don't. Um, I looked at the impact on the win rate of how many spells with mana value five or more in your deck do you have. Mm. And it seems to me that in order for the beanstalk to be good, you need at least five of those spells oh, in your deck. Five of them. That's in order for your deck to be good. And in order for your deck to be great, you need six or more. That's your probably uh, what you should be aiming. And I think that if you have nine or more, that becomes detrimental because that's just too many five drops. I mean, isn't six or more already getting into that stage? Like where the rest of your deck not is worse you, off? Not if you think about the context of it. Like um, I mean, some of the... those five drops will be like Obira's Attendance or mm. uh, Ginger Hunter, Ginger uh, which Hunter. have... Gin that's the 5-5 five, five that can... Gingerbread yeah, the, Hunter. The Golgari Adventure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a Ginger Hunter is a very different That's a different thing. thing. <laughs> yeah. We're not going into that. Luckily, Sirkovitz is safe from, from that for a variety of reasons. Yes. <laughs> I'm follic follically incompatible with that kind of... Um, uh. But no, I, I, I think this is a, one of the sets where you can get away with that many fives because a lot of the fives are also secretly twos. Okay. Yeah, yeah, remember, Imodane's Recruiter is a five, yeah? Uh, just saying. Okay, so go on. So the six is, the, but if you get up to nine, that's when it starts hurting? That's when it starts hurting. And it's also, uh, when you have six, um, five, mana, mana value, uh, five mana value or more uh, spells in your deck, the win rate, if you have up the beanstalk, is going to be 57%. In the games that where you draw the um, up the beanstalk, uh, that goes up by 3.3%. Oh, okay. Points. Wow, okay. So you go up to like 60.3. And if you don't draw it, your uh, win rate is actively smaller. So this shows you that actually having that up the beanstalk in those decks is beneficial. But at the same time, when you have three five mana spells and you have up the beanstalk, your average win rate is going to be 53.6. And um, if you draw the up the beanstalk, your win rate actually goes down by two percentage points. So hmm. that's the difference we're talking about here. Okay. Hmm. And there will be some cards that are specifically good in up to beanstalk decks. I, I tested those, and um, lots of those cards will be the five drops that you would be expecting. So the Gingerbread Hunter, um, the High Fae Negotiator seems like a good card. I told you that Golgari is the best one, so obviously most of those cards will fit in Golgari decks. Shatter the Oath becomes all of a sudden a good um, removal. Uh, Agatha's Champion, that's another five drop. Uh, Two funny cards that I found that they were quite um, improved in the of the Mistock decks. One is uh, Fairy Fencing, mm, okay. because of course, normally it's good only in fairies because you need certain density of fairies for the card to become good. But if you have up the Beanstalk, you can play X equals four and you have a five mana cost. Yeah. Uh, and you draw an extra card that pushes it uh, across the line in terms of the card quality. And the other one is the Stone Splitter Bolt, the red card mm -hmm. that uh, deals X damage, because you also can play five mana for it. So you have this kind of variable uh, five drop that you can use maybe earlier in the game to kill something small but uh, if you draw it in the late game you get an additional card draw from it so yeah, yeah. that makes sense that's interesting. I, 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 I think there was a missed opportunity design wise for them to have fairy fencing cost more like x is plus three when you have a fairy so you could spend two mana and have played a five mana spell like oh. they could have just templated it slightly differently so that you so that, <laughs> that, that would work so i it, think that would have been cooler it just adds mana to it that's kind of fun. yeah Mm. Oh, yeah, that would be cool. That would be well, way, way cool. Um, and the other cards that are good are early interaction things. So like Feed the Cauldron is especially good because it kills something. Uh, you will probably not have too many two drops because you already have so many five drops in your deck. So you want to have that early interaction that lets you survive. It will give you the food that also will stabilize you. Rat Out becomes pretty good in those decks. Uh, which is Vanity. All the things that deal with something early. Um, couple of other cards like Hopeless Nightmare because it just uh, slows the game down because the opponent needs to discard something, which will probably mean that they won't have this amazing curve out uh, coming in. Right. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that's 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 more or less what you need to know about the, up the Beanstalk in the, in the Limited. Okay, and then the last thing we wanted to talk about was more broader strokes about win rates and how to interpret them. What are you... What are you but what are you seeing for that? What what do you want to tell us about it? Because again, this goes back to what I, I mentioned at the beginning about, you know, fundamentals of interpreting this data and not letting things like 17 lands actually lead, lead us down the wrong path rather than the right one. That was a very good segue just half an hour too early. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, tap back on it. <laughs> but 
Yeah, I mean, uh, this part came from the number of times I'm listening to people who are angry with the data, mainly because they will hear it being used as a sort of hammer that ends the discussion. Uh, someone says, oh, this card, I don't know if it's good or if it's bad, and someone will write, well, it has 59% game in hand win rate on 17 lands. Boom, done, discussion yeah, finished. Yeah, discussion over. Yeah, I've heard that a lot. And I am not a big fan of that. And of course, because I'm a person that is generally associated with data and magic, I hear a lot of that complaint while myself trying not to be the person that uses this hammer argument in discussions because I do know that there is like so much more behind it. And um, I like to think about win rate slightly differently because when people say win rate, it's usually there's one number behind it. But when you think about it, there's hundreds of decks that make that number. And among those hundreds of decks, and I'm going to give you the example of Titanic Growth, very uh, underplayed card in this format. But uh, I, I have a quick question first. Marshall, have you yet put a Titanic Growth in your deck? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I didn't think so either. <laughs> not, not really I, don't think it's, I, I don't think it has Marshall written all over it. No, I, I, it no, doesn't bounce creatures into opponents' hands. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, but... Generally, this is the kind of a card that when you look at the data and when you look at the Gruul data specifically on 17 lands, this is like the fourth uh, highest win rate common in, in Gruul. Mm -hmm. And you might think, okay, that's a great card in Gruul. You should be playing it in Gruul. But then you can look at some other things. Like there is a small sample size of it. And also, if you look at the top player's um, play rate of that card, it's like 40%, which means that 60% of the time people draft it, they don't even put it in their deck. And this is already like something else than just the win rate. You look at those um, numbers and you think there's something going wrong. The card can be clearly good, but it's not good in every single deck. And this is the whole thing of thinking about um, of thinking about uh, win rate. You know that if a card has a high win rate, it will be good in at least some amount and probably a large amount of decks that's being played in. But there's still going to be decks that the card is medium in, and there's an, probably some number of decks that the card is going to be bad in. And especially with cards like uh, Titanic Growth, that's going to be very variable on, on uh, how you build your decks. Good players will probably only put Titanic Growth when they think it fits the plan, and um, very frequently there will be the right choices. Uh, but maybe players that will draft strictly by looking at the win rates uh, are going to jam it in way too many decks than the card should be, and then they're going to be wondering why this card is not winning for them. So. Just to show you the amount of extra work you need to, uh, the, the amount of extra walking you need to do to figure out um, how to play uh, the particular card, I basically had to look at all the decks that contain uh, Titanic Growth and Gruel. Then I divided them into the sort of two categories the, the decks that have five wins or more and the decks that have four wins and less. Okay. And then I just sort of looked at which cards are in those both categories uh, slightly differentially to, to look at the cards that are more in the Titanic Growth decks. And this gave me sort of an answer that I, I found boring, uh, that uh, the good Titanic Growth decks are different from the bad Titanic Growth decks because the good Titanic Growth decks have more Gruff Triplets and uh, huh. Imodane's Recruiters and Godric's and uh, Huntsman Redemptions and, and, that, and that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, the, the good Titanic Growth decks. That's yeah. What yeah. <laughs> so then I thought, okay, this is not giving me the answer. But you know, I, I, I had to check that before I give you an answer. So then I decided to compare the good Titanic Growth decks, the ones that had five wins and more, with the good Gruel decks that did not have the Titanic growth. Okay. And then I looked at the cards that uh, are differential in that. And then I saw something that was much more interesting to make me understand what makes the Titanic growth tick. For example, uh, the good Titanic growth decks had 86% more uh, season of growth than the just regular Gruel decks without the Titanic growth. So... I can see that Titan Season of Growth can be an interesting build around, and it actually can work, and Titanic Growth is a large part of that equation. Okay. Also, other two cards that were uh, over most of over present in those Titanic Growth decks were Leaping Ambush and Bestial Bloodline. So all the things that will go also together with the Season of Growth. So two things that target your creatures uh, will draw your card when you have Season of Growth. Other cards that I saw was... Um, a bunch of one drops. I've seen uh, Harry Spearguard quite a lot more, a uh, Ginger Brute quite a lot more. Ginger Brute not only being a one drop, but also being a one drop that can potentially become a super evasive creature. Mm -hmm. So I can 
activate my ginger root, attack unblockable, cast my um, titanic growth on it, and it becomes a sort of like a mini lava axe uh, all of a sudden. Um, there are creatures that have uh, some sort of um, evasion. So there is the Verdant Outrider, the 4-2, that can be given unblockability in certain circumstances. Um, and there's Ferocious Werefox, which is a trampler. And, you know, with plus 4, plus 4, hopefully Tramp will become sort of evasion to the part of the power of that creature. Um, and there's also a couple of things with a Double Strike, like Picnic Ruiner was there, Two-Headed Hunter. Those two cards were uh, pretty good in those, um, in those uh, titanic, titanic Growth decks. More so, they were played there more so than in regular Gruel decks. And then after I analyzed that part, I also tried to see which cards are more present in regular Gruel decks, but not present in those Titanic Growth decks. And then I saw like a whole bunch of stuff that was like Prophetic Prism, Swamps, Plains, Return from the Wilds, Brave the Wilds, okay. um, Crystal Grotto. Uh, so all the fixing. So basically, if you want to play your Titanic Growths, you cannot Dirtle, which already excludes Marshall from the group of people yeah. who will be willing to play Titanic Growth. Yeah. Uh, also, Up the Beanstalk was one of the cards that was there. Because you want to have your early drops, you want to build a wide board, be super aggressive, and then use your uh, Titanic Growth in a sort of analogous version of the uh, Knowing Crescendo if you're playing uh, Red Black. Yep, that makes sense. A way to finish off the game. And but, those support yeah. creatures are the best yeah, ways. But, but the, the point is, the point is, I could either say Titanic growth is good in red green, or I can spend three hours trying to analyze this data and come up with all those answers just to write like a unreadable 20, uh, 20 post thread on Twitter. Um, and obviously, for most people, it's just going to be easy to say, well, Titanic growth is good in red green. Right, but and, if and you there, really want to like understand why Titanic growth is good in red green and which red green it is good in, you have to do all that work, or or you know find find someone to do it for you. Yeah, that's like a great you. example of what you're talking about. Re really d well done, Sirky, because that that really does illustrate what you're talking about. Because that number that the that the person sees on their screen encapsulates all of those. Right. And We're, more. I mean, this is yeah. just like licking the surface, honestly. But uh. right. And, you know, because I mean, people have to realize that because what that really means, right, is that Titanic growth actually performs probably quite mediocre when it ends up making its way into the decks that do have the prophetic prisms or the up the beanstalks or the dirtily other splashing and that kind of stuff. Right. It's probably significantly lower than the whatever 59 percent or whatever you said. But it means that, you know, for the decks that have you know, that build around or the stuff that, you know, the ginger brutes where it's like hyper aggressive and stuff like that, it actually is performing probably significantly better, right? Probably get a couple of percent up on even that number there. So, you know, when you're looking at an average over things that aren't apples to apples, that's what you're going to get, right? You're going to, you are capturing the downside of playing that card in a deck that doesn't really want it simultaneously to playing it in a deck that does and the upside that comes along with it, which means if you cite the medium, then you probably are missing on both, right? It's, it's, it's a weird concept that you have to kind of be able to grasp. It's, it makes sense once you get it, but you know, when, when I've tried to teach people poker before, you know, I tried to teach them their expected value from a pot, right? So, you know, let's say that they get themselves into a 50-50 situation and there's $100, their expected value is $50. So every time they make that bet, on average, they make $50. But on any given bet, they cannot make $50. It is either 100 or zero every single time. And that's a lot. Some people, especially that are kind of like not into statistics or don't really think of things that way, are like, but I can't make 50. So you're telling me that that action I just made made me $50, but I literally can't make $50 at it, right? And it's similar here where it's like that 59% that we're looking at might not represent what you actually get because you're either a dirtily deck or a hyper aggressive deck. I know that there's other versions of green red that we could put in the middle, but in a world where those were the two most popular or best versions of the deck, you know, Basically, we're saying Titanic growth is actually never 59. It's either 62 if you're <laughs> hyper aggressive or it's 52 or 54 or whatever if you're in the dirtily deck. And the 59 actually doesn't come out kind of ever, 
right? Which is really funny because it means that if you are the person who's planting your flag on that as part of your argument, you're almost in that convoluted scenario that I came up with, you're wrong all the time. <laughs> it's yeah, always that's... either better or worse and it's not in the middle, which is kind of funny because I guarantee you the person who's making that assumption and you know trying to die on the hill of fourth best common in this archetype, 59%, you know, is has not thought of that yet. Yeah. And yeah, I, that that's a great way of putting it, I think. And I think that one thing to keep in mind, and also one reason why looking at the top player data is uh, pretty useful, is that top players will have a higher proportion of correct decks for a particular card in their data sample. Like, I am i don't really mind uh, the data for Torch the Tower. People play Torch the Tower, uh, if they play red, they if play 99.2%. Nine percent of the time uh, that they drafted it, maybe they will, you know, like cut the seventh one. Although I, I don't think I would do that either. Um, but if you look at the general, even seventeen lands data uh, for all the players, you will find that people put cards, uh, especially those niche ones, in an incorrect shell. And especially when you look at the early data from the format, when people still didn't figure out those things. So limiting the data you look through makes the quality of your data better because you will see more of the more percentages of those games that you are analyzing are going to be looking at the proper decks that use the card in the way that it should be used and is the most efficient way of using the card. Yeah. So by playing around with those tiers, you can actually figure something out. And this is, again, something that can trap people that sometimes you see cards that have super high win rates and then people will say, oh, that must be a great card. And then it turns out that like 90% of the data for that card has been generated by one player who figured out this one way of playing this one deck. And they are really, really a good player. And because of that, it has a high win rate because that player has, you know, 64% win rate. And that doesn't say anything about the card. If you try to replicate it, you probably are not going to reproduce mm. it. And if you just look at the sheer number, you can fall into one of those kind of traps. And Titanic Growth, again, is a good example here because it disproportionately play more by top players because there must have been a couple of at least top players that figured out this ultra aggressive uh, gruel archetype. Yeah, that's really interesting. Is there, how do you, can, can we dig into it? I, I remember the, that tool that you had been working on. I don't know if it's still around where you, you know, the visualize, sorry, that seems like it might be a headache. I brought it up twice and you've given a similar reaction, but is there a way to filter this stuff on 17 lands or, uh, I do it by eye, sort of. I mean, I try to look what, how many times do I see uh, a certain card played by the top players, and I, then I look like you know something like Torch the Tower, which we played as often as you can, and and that other card, and I sort of calculate the ratio of those two in my head. But but where do you I look? look? The, I, if somebody wanted to, like, oh, let's say, yeah. the, you know, there was a card that they wanted to do a little more of a deep dive on. First of all, if you want to do a deep dive, I'm going to make a plug for the uh, extra Patreon features that 17 Lands introduced. You are a patron. You should be getting those. Okay, you great. Can, you can click on the card name and you can get uh, a, actually a, quite an interesting um, quite an interesting view of the card. So uh, uh, you get like the win rates for each color pair. You will see in which color combinations does the card improve the win rate compared to the average. You can see... Uh, That's awesome. Strength evaluation, you can see how this win rate changed over time. Uh, also an interesting to see the sort of like metagame uh, shifts of the win rates of particular cards. I think that's like very neatly done. It's done by the same person in terms of visualization that was uh, behind the archetypist. So it's like oh, really yeah. cool. Um, okay, really that's cool graphs. awesome. So, yeah. yeah. So I would highly recommend if you are a patron to to check those out because those uh, new features are quite cool. What do I do? Do I just need to log in on 17 lands to have Yeah, you linked? log into the 17 lands and if you have a patron then if you go to the card data, the card names now should be blue and if you have them blue you can click on them and they basically and take you to stuff? the individual oh. page of the of the of each card, yeah. Watch so out arena drafters, that, I, I got know. a new tool in my belt. Yeah, you, you can see that uh, the Princess Takes Flight is actually best in white-red for some reason. Uh, Could be anything. Being, oh, <laughs> but it also like no, it also improves the win rate of white-red by quite a lot. I bet it does. Um, so, uh, they can capitalize yeah, but, on, you know, t even if it's temporarily moving a blocker, right? Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, these are cool, but uh, generally in the card data, you will find all the kind of stuff. So uh, you can look at top cards in, in Gru, let's say, and filter so them by the top players. Um, um, look at the commons only. Okay, click, click, click. And then I see the is this in the, is this is in like the draft the, metagame or what tab do I go and to? And it's analytics card data. Analytics card data. Yeah. And then I do top users. Yeah. And then deck color, all decks, no, just click red green and then uh -huh. filter by common. So you have it. You, you should have Titanic Growth as the third best card. All right, red yeah. green. And then do commons. And filter them by the game and have win rate. And then game in hand win rate. You should get Titanic Growth as the third uh, as the third card. Yep. Do you see that? It is showing up as number one for me. Oh, does it? Yeah. Not top towards green. the tower. Oh. Oh, you you pick them. Up, you pick the green cards. Yeah. I do multicolor, or what do I do? No, just just pick any color. Just so you see you're both uh, red and green. Yep, you're right. Torch Tower, Titanic Growth, number three. Yeah, okay, so now you can see that number of games in hand. Uh, you have 5,541 for Torch the Tower mm -hmm. and 1,400 roughly for Titanic Growth, so roughly one third. And then gotcha. if you go to the bottom bottom players, uh -huh. uh, first of all, Torch the Tower will be uh, first, and then yes. you will have to scroll quite a long way before you find the Titanic Growth. Wow! Actually, you won't right. you won't even find it because it's not even large enough sample size for um, uh, for players. So let's maybe move to the middle players at least. You should get the wow. number there. I thought bottom players would like the. Yeah, I'm well, they, they, they clearly don't. Player. If you go to the middle players, weirdly, Minecraft Daredevil is the top winning card, but that's a different story. You should. Get... I did find Titanic growth. There is Titanic growth somewhere deep down. Yeah, fifty-five point um, three. Yeah. But yeah, and, and it's like nine hundred to three thousand three hundred, so it's below one third of the of the of the games that uh, that are using it. So it's lower and lower, and I'm pretty sure it's even lower at the uh, the bottom players. That's why there is not even a, a win rate data for those cards, and that means that the data for that card is disproportionately generated by the top players, and because of that, the win rate is going to be elevated. Not because the card is good but because the good players all play it more frequently than uh, than the low win rate players. And it's not the big issue with the Titanic growth because you will still see that it's a powerful card and you can potentially draw something, but a lot of cards will have the opposite when they are disproportionately played by weaker players, and then it's hard to uh, figure out that the card can be actually situationally good. I see. Because you will see it somewhere down, and people lose interest in that because they say, well, that's got a win low win rate. Um, it doesn't look exciting. Probably there is no way. And there's someone there sitting like this and thinking, <laughs> OK, I can force it every single time because no one figured that one out. Uh, yeah. No, if you look at the data with the uh, appropriate level of um, detail, then you can figure those things out. OK, yeah, that's great stuff. What's the what's the big picture takeaway from this part of the discussion? Um, not to put too much emphasis on any one number um know when you should like what, what's the big picture for our i viewers? think that the big takeaway that you should be having from this is that every number is thousands of measurements and if there are thousands of measurements you cannot treat it as an integral part and think about it that um there is more complexity behind it and just don't get satisfied with one number. Of course, for your daily use, it's fine to use it. If you're comparing things as your first pick, it's fine to use it, no problem. But just know, at least have the awareness that there is more behind the bonnet than uh, than, than you see in that one manifestation of a number. Luisa, Especially that means under with the, the cards hood. like the, that are niche played, playables. I translated that. Under the hood, more under the hood. Behind <laughs> yeah, the yeah, bonnet, that's... <laughs> All right. That's great stuff, Sirico. Thanks a lot uh, for coming on. Where can people find you um, and find your stuff if they want to check out more of your data analysis? Yeah, you can always watch the illustrious uh, Ristic study episode with me. Uh, there oh, yeah. you go. I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Our friend I Sam was, over no. at uh, Ristic Studies put out another one of his excellent top tier beautifully crafted videos and somehow shoehorned Sirkovitz into it. I, 
I have no idea. I have no idea. It's me and Kurt Vonnegut somehow in this episode. So <laughs> that's you know, great company, man. You, you, get you, better. I, I'm, I'm not going to complain Pops about being author. Put, yeah, he's he's on I my did, short list too. I did read a bunch of him when I was uh, you? when I was younger, and I still read. <laughs> yeah, my name was Malachi Constant on um, on Halo. So there you go. I'm a true lifer. <laughs> um. So yeah, that's it. I also have a Twitter that I I've put like a bunch of vlogger threads recently uh, that include stuff that we are talking today, and I think I'm going to continue putting them because I enjoy writing them. So uh, that's okay. that's nice. And, and I do have my podcast, Magic Numbers, which I highly recommend you to listen to. And I'll make sure to... Can they find uh, Magic Numbers off your Twitter? Yeah, I have like a link tree in my uh, okay. in my description on the Twitter. So Okay, I'll put a link to your Twitter and to your uh, video with Sam from Mystic Studies as well, so people can check that out. Uh, Sirico, thanks oh, yeah. again. And obviously, oh. yeah, sorry. Ob- obviously, obviously, uh, as we were talking about 17 Lands, one more plug, please do support them. They're awesome. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, we they are invaluable part of how we process limited these days. They also have been um, the starters and sometimes enders of a lot of awesome conversations. So yeah, <laughs> we've got at <laughs> least <both>? that <laughs> yeah going on as well, uh, and and definitely something that if you want to really dig down and figure out what's going on in limited, that's a great place to do it. Sirko, thanks again uh, for coming on, man. Always a pleasure. Yeah. What were you going to say? I was going to say I'm super interested about how the Kans of Tarkir are going to end up on 17 Lens and challenge the uh, recollections of the format of oh. people that played it. We should we should come up with some predicted, like some truths, right? What are the truths about Kans of Tarkir that we remember? And then let the format play out and then see if if they hold. Yeah. That, we should, we, when, when, when does it go live? I don't know. Somewhere like before Christmas, I guess. There's a lot, there's a, there's a decent amount of time be, between here and Christmas. Yeah, All right, like we'll, after we'll have... the Excellent gets released and before Christmas, so probably halfway between Excellent release and Christmas, I would be guessing like I don't know, tenth of December ish. Okay. Okay. We'll have to we'll have to put our we, we're going to make some predictions. Uh... Yeah, we can put it in the subreddit too and let people vote for you know things that yeah. we all take for granted to be true about cons for people that have drafted it. It is a little tough. It's then, been almost ten years since it came out. Then right? we're going to see like uh, I think? Lewis uh, forcing the drafts just to inflate the numbers on some cards. So I know how it's going to end. <laughs> yeah, he'll get his army uh, drafting. Well, I mean. It, if you want my actual dream, it would be uh, 17 lands for Magic Online, so that I could actually figure out uh, the, the some of some of the cube. Data. I mean, good part of Magic Online is that already is in Excel. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, come it on, man. Is. We love Moto. Don't say that. I mean, you know, has... Ryan listens to this podcast. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Circo. All right, that's gonna do it. Uh, for this episode. Thanks again to Circo for coming on. If you want to find us on social media, Marshall underscore LR and Luis's LSV, there'll be a link to Sirkovitz's uh, Twitter video and 17 lands as well in the show notes for this episode. If you'd like to uh, check out any of that, we want to say thank you once again to our patrons for supporting us. It means the world and we really thank you for it. And with that, we'll see you next week. Well, on the topic of 17 lands for cubes, I, I would I would be really interested to find out which cards live up to the hype and which don't. Because it's really hard to tell, right? Because it's really hard. I mean, here's here's a really good one. Library of Alexandria. Mm-hmm. Like I've actually gone up and down and then down, uh, you know, up again, and then down again on that. I'm actually currently at a low point with library uh, where – I thought library was overrated, you know, some number of years ago, seven years ago or whatever. And I think a lot of people still remember me talking about how I didn't think it was that good. And they, took, they took that very personally when you did that for some reason. Yeah, and I took and that You weren't personally. even that harsh, but anyway, go on. And then I, you know, then I thought it got a little better because, I don't know, that like there's good interactive spells you could pair with it. Like kind of it had gotten so lowly rated that you could get it seventh picker you know, in that vein. And like, I thought that was not good enough. I, I kind of think library sucks again. now. <laughs> like, really? I like it, but anyway, I just don't think you can spend turn one, not doing anything. Yeah. And, I, I could see know, the argument. You basically need to be playing a whole things. game behind cube is so fast now. So I'm curious what cards like that, where they would actually land, like how would people do? Because 
some of the other cards that I think people take like super highly that I'm kind of curious about, like Mind Twist, Mana Drain, some of these like cards that were clearly great and now it's less clear to me that they are. And the best debate to settle, what is the best pick What's one the actual card? best card? Oh my God, yeah. I personally still am going to take Time Walk over every other card in the cube. I think that there's so many ways to utilize it that just are obscene. But is it better than Soul Ring pick one, pack one? I would believe – I mean this is this goes back to the data thing where like I would believe that the average cuber should take Soul Ring over Time Walk because Soul Ring is just always great and it's really hard to mess up with it. Whereas Time Walk, you got to kind of know what you're looking for to make it great. It already is like obviously very, 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 very good. To maximize Time Walk, yeah, you want to find Spellseeker, Regrowth, Tolarian Academy decks or decks that do big things every turn, Planeswalkers, whatever. Planeswalkers, yep. But w- w- what if we found out that, like, you know, Mana Crypt was the best card to pick one, pack one? Or, or like some, Endurance. And, and and we have some kind of primitive versions of this data uh, with Magic Online has given us some things like the deck – what – how what number of average wins do do players get when they first pick a card using that though it's like student of warfare is one of the top 15 cards in the cube yeah. because white weenie is so good so if you first pick a student warfare you're, you're going to get on average 2.6 wins or whatever it is 2.1 wins mm-hmm. that's not i think we could do better than that and the circuits can tell you a lot of reasons why that would not be like the optimal way to measure how good cards are um it is a way though i mean it is a way yeah <laughs> um but I think that I'm just kind of curious which of these cards, like there's some big unanswered questions for me. Like how good are the cards I named? Which is the, what is the best card? Is Oko better than Minsk and Boo? You know, should Treachery still be in the cube? Like, (laughs) you know, there, there's, there's some interesting stuff. Like I've kind of personally felt, for example, like that Kiki Jiki Splinter Twin is just not that great of a strategy anymore. I'm, I'm really not willing to, to take that. And that's not just, I don't think this is a good strategy. It's more like, I, I'm not willing to third pick a Kiki-Jiki. Other people are. I don't get to play the strategy. Mm-hmm. And that's like comparing the Alsa, right? Uh, like yeah. with with uh, with everyone else's. Whereas like I'm willing to six pick a Kiki-Jiki. I'm not willing to second or third pick it. Other players are clearly willing to do the second and third pick it. I have a very low number of drafted Kiki-Jikis as, as a result. And I mean, another question I kind of want to know. I take Tillerian Academy over basically anything that's not power at this point. Is that how, like, is that wrong? How wrong is that? For me personally, I felt like it's pretty good because I'm able to frequently draft the decks where this is like not only the centerpiece, but the deck ends up busted. But I mean, I could certainly believe that it would be a mistake to take a Tillerian Academy first pick, first pack over Thoughtseize, over Swords to Plowshares. You know, these are some picks I've actually made. So. All I'm saying is I would love uh, I would love 17 lands for 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 cube. I don't want to know. 